from KOA Engineering, a traffic engineer, as a team. And we have too many representatives here from the city for me to go around and name everybody at this point. But welcome, <laughs> welcome to uh, council members who are here. I should point out that this is not a council meeting, even though we are in the council chambers, and the council will not be uh, deliberating on anything tonight. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, we're in this room because we couldn't find another one, and uh, got kicked out of a few. So, um, and it's a busy town, so there were also lots of conflicting events. Um, somehow, I think it's going to be better to talk without the mic. Is it better or is it worse? Better. How's that? Does that work? Yeah. Okay, good. A lot more comfortable. Okay, um, David, put it up another button. workshops on the uh, Culver City TOD visioning study and we have been meeting with most of you many of you anyway familiar faces from the beginning starting in uh, March I think was the first one and uh, I just want to go quickly uh, through where we've come from so you get a sense of what's happened so far and briefly <coughs> talk about what the overall mission of this study is so in the first workshop, we asked some pretty general questions as if we were newbies in town and knew nothing about Culver City. What's Culver City about? What is special about it? What are the features that are being challenged by current conditions in mobility? Traffic conditions being the first kind of thing that comes to people's mind. The second and third workshops were different. In the second one, we got on bikes. We biked around the TOD area. And on the third one, we did the same thing, but on foot. It was interesting to see how it looks different from those two perspectives, and different yet again from how it looks when you're in a car. I think we all learned, we certainly learned a lot, but I think some of the participants learned things too, having not attempted, for example, in recent time to cross Venice Boulevard on a bicycle. <laughs> and it's an adventure. Um, we had to sign liability waivers, but uh, <laughs> on the fourth workshop, we collected all that we had heard up to that point and tried to organize it into the, the ideas, the, the collections of ideas that had been coming out of the workshop sessions, the things that people were concerned about, the things that were problems and issues for them, and ideas that people had for addressing them and solving them. And on the fifth, we broke format again, had a roundtable discussion with a group of prominent design community members, prominent architects here in Culver City, uh, which is a city with a lot of architects, a lot of very prominent architects. And like prominent architects, when you get them together and talk, nobody agrees with, it, with each other and you hear a lot of ideas that are kind of all over the place, but it was a way of, of sort of changing a little bit the focus of the conversation from some of the very specific concerns of neighborhood issues that were specific to particular streets or particular blocks or particular intersections and starting to think on a broader scale about mobility as a construct in Culver City, particularly on the east end of Culver City. In the sixth workshop, we had um, a series of um, what we called Todd Talks, that were briefings by experts on transportation demand management, smart cities, and complete streets as ways that we might think about approaching the issue of mobility in Culver City. In the seventh, the, last, the most recent one, we took all of those 
ideas that we heard from that came out of the workshop sessions. We took all of the issues that we collected from input on our web page and developed an idea book that each breaking into smaller groups, we reviewed the uh, groups reviewed and reported back on things that they preferred and didn't prefer. During this whole process, we've also had an active web page. And it's still active, and we would still welcome you to go there and use it, because we have a couple of interactive functions on it that have been very useful to us. We have an interactive map that allows you to place your comments on a particular location, which we can then track. The website is www.culvertodvision.org. And you can go to the interactive map, post your comments. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, unfortunately it's at the bottom, and some people don't know it's there, there's a comment tool as well, where you can make open-ended comments to us. It comes directly to the team as email. We look at them all. We received, I forget the last count, but some 450, I think, comments um, on the web page. And they weren't all from Don. <laughs> <laughs> I see you. I see you, Don. <laughs> um, which is why we put a limit to the number of comments any individual can make. But um, we had about 450 comments or more, and we've gone through all of those as we've progressed here through our studies so that we understand what the concerns are in the community. And, and there have been some you know, very, very good, very clear, very articulate criticisms of, of, of the current mobility situation and a lot of good ideas. One of those ideas are conflicting with one another, which is to be expected. And so our task as we move now into this final phase of coming up with recommendations to council for a mobility framework or a mobility vision for the TOD area is to take all of those ideas, weigh the ones in conflict, understand where the better or, or most optimal uh, choices lay, how they relate to all of the other choices that need to be made, and come up with an array of recommendations which we're going to present to you tonight. I'm calling them preliminary recommendations because you're the first to see them, and our intention is that tonight you can tell us what you think of them, and that commentary will be incorporated into what we then present to the city over the next several weeks. I think um, we're on council agenda for late August, is that it, Lisa? I think August 28th. So we're headed toward a presentation that will be more formal than these workshop sessions. And there will be a, a formal session of council. So in, um, I've got 73 slides and I've gotten to the first two in 10 minutes, so we're here for a while. I'll <laughs> um, try to go faster on the rest. Um, the recommendations that we're going to be reviewing with you tonight fall into a number of categories. And the first set of categories is what we call connected networks. And these become frameworks or principles that help us to understand how best to evaluate and enact certain other recommendations that fall into more discrete categories. So the first is this framework of connected networks. The second is neighborhood protection. And frankly, what we heard most from residents who participated in these workshop sessions are, are recommendations for measures that would fall into the category of neighborhood protection. How can you keep your residential neighborhood a quiet residential neighborhood and prevent it be from becoming overrun with outside traffic or traffic that doesn't belong there? A third category is wayfinding in the uh, experience of using transit here in Culver City, Culver City uh, particularly starting from the Expo Station. Um, it's a confusing city geographically, we'll say. Uh, we've talked before about the street networks and their historical origins and so forth, and while that gives a certain charm to the character of the place, it doesn't make it easy to find a way around. And as someone who may not be so familiar with where they are, gets off of the expo line at Culver City, they're confronted with a problem of figuring out where to go and how to get there. Uh, if they're transferring to a bus, the signage isn't clear. If they want to go to downtown or to the Arts District or the Hayden Track, those directions are not clear. 
is things that we'll be recommending in that. Next category is TOD expansion and standards. Um, the TOD, as we'll see in the slides in a few minutes, is a relatively constrained area within the east end of Culver City. For reasons we'll argue shortly, we think it should be expanded so that the principles and conditions that ride with a transit-oriented development district, a TOD district, can be applied productively and effectively and um, allow for development in the future to meet standards that the city would like to see met in a way that's clear to the developer as they propose their work in the front end the beginning too. It's a, it's a matter of having clear expectations in both directions. And finally, we're going to talk about transportation demand management as a kind of mechanism or tool for organizing a lot of these other principles. And saved for last is really what we think is the, the, the heart or the spine or some part of the body of the uh, city, which is Washington Boulevard, as it goes from downtown to La Cienega. And you'll see that we have a, a rather detailed set of proposals for the entire length of the boulevard. All of these are cast in a frame of a vision statement. And I should just briefly say that what a vision is is different from an implementation plan. And the vision is going to offer a set of goals, a set of priorities, a, a way to, uh, to head a kind of uh, beacon that you can aim for. And all of these other things will be decisions that necessarily will be implemented over a long period of time. But by keeping the vision clear in one's head as one makes those decisions, you can avoid precluding certain outcomes by making mistakes in the short term. So the purpose of the vision is to, is to paint the big picture and then look at different ways that you can get there, some short term, some long. So one of the first things that we've got to talk about here as a group, and we've talked about this three or four times, I think, in the last several sessions, is that the priorities for mobility are pedestrians first. This came strongly from a lot of the input we had from the workshops and from the website about people essentially complaining that it's just hard to walk around in this town. There are lots of places that it's just either dangerous or you go down a path that stops, or you have to cross a major boulevard, or any number of or it's just plain boring. <laughs> a street may not have life enough on it that walking on it makes a difference. So pedestrians first becomes the first priority. Transit next, because that's what's going to help people move in the future. And it's not just transit as you know it now, but transit as it will evolve in the future. Transit that will become product of new technologies that at this point, quite frankly, we can't even fully anticipate, but what we know, given the priority of this problem and the severity of it and the way in which it is growing in <coughs> urban centers worldwide, will be the focus of a lot of innovation in the coming decade or so. Then bikes, because that we know about, and we can get around readily on bikes, many of us, and there are a lot of trips that we can make on bikes that we that we can do instead of getting in our car if there's a safe and convenient way to do it. So we look at bikes. And then finally cars. We don't ignore them. But it's not putting cars first. I think if you had been, uh, as many of you were, at the Todd talk for the um, transportation demand management um, subject a few sessions ago, uh, Jeff England talked about the mobility plan in Vancouver. And what they have found in Vancouver is that by not putting cars first, but by focusing on these other modalities, they've actually improved the environment for the cars. It's counterintuitive, but that's what they found in Vancouver. So we're following this priority of objectives, a priority of, of, of features or elements as we move into our plan. So you've seen this before too, but just to remind us, what we're talking about is that we have a, a kind of fundamental problem where we have large-scale regional transportation that runs through as in the form of the freeway just north of this area. It's the gray line there. Yeah, that's, thank you, Joel. Um, I've got a pointer, but it doesn't show up on the screen. Um, we've got sub-regional connectors of major boulevards, Venice Boulevard, Jefferson Boulevard, um, Overland Avenue. and and La Cienega, 
all of which carry a lot of sub-regional circulation in car traffic. And then we've got Washington Boulevard that is caught betwixt and between. It's, tr it's, it's really scaled as a local road in the stretch of Culver City, but it's having to function as a sub-regional conduit, and it's not working. <coughs> So we're going to look at how we can recast these things so that they fall, those, those features fall more into the categories that they belong in rather than Washington Boulevard trying to be what it can't be. First connected network as part of the framework is a pedestrian network. And we're proposing that a number of of the streets within the central TOD area be connected by easements or pedestrian paseos that would pass through future development. We'll talk about what future development prospects there are here in a few moments, but in anticipation of demand for new development in the vicinity of the TOD, ways that we can go connect for pedestrians from the transit center and from the neighborhoods into downtown and into uh, the east side of Washington to the Arts District with a more comfortable and a more pleasant pedestrian environment, a more convenient one. We're looking at National Boulevard as a problem as well. It's not just Washington. Um, the sidewalk on the south side of National Boulevard, if any of you have walked it recently, um, know that it's not easy to do. <laughs> um, so we've got proposals for short-term and long-term um, fixes on it. In the short term, we'll talk about that when we get to uh, some of the more detailed drawings, but in the short term, some reconfiguring of the Washington and National intersection that widens the sidewalk for at least the first portion of uh, the west to east um, uh, sidewalk area. And then in the long term, as development turns over in the Hayden Tract and elsewhere, requiring some additional setback that would provide enough room for a more comfortable sidewalk along National. Want to talk, uh, Andrea, a little bit about how this works? Um, sure. Here. Um, so this sketch in particular is looking at um, Washington Boulevard National uh, Boulevard intersection. Um, to make it work, there are some constraints on the south side. Um, so by eliminating the right turn that goes into um, Wesley South, we can widen the sidewalk enough to make it comfortable for uh, walking on the south portion of the south. So this is what this sketch is showing. Um, and also by introducing some additional setbacks for future development, we can increase the size of the sidewalks on the south side of National, which is really the only place where you can have uh, major um, pedestrian access and um, movement in, 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 in that corridor. Thanks. <coughs> sure. And it's not just connecting within the TOD area, but rather connecting to the pedestrian network um, throughout the city so that, for example, the walk from downtown to Veterans Park is a walkable walk. Um, looking at ways to connect to the um, uh, Bayona Creek uh, bike path and, and walk and future improvements along Bayona Creek as part of the pedestrian circulation system that would allow for uh, better pedestrian movement. So the general categories then are Paseos and mid-block crossings, fixing broken connections. There are a number of places by instituting easements, for example, through future development sites, you can connect pedestrian paths that are currently blocked by existing uh, development. Uh, pedestrian priority streets that are improved for the safety of pedestrians and are uh, then that happens through calming of traffic. Uh, active street frontage, I didn't talk about that, but the uses, for example, along Washington Boulevard, that at street level, the uses should be required to be active uses, retail uses, restaurant uses, entertainment uses, so that the walk on Washington Boulevard, for example, from the transit station to Parcel B to the downtown, to the town square, um, 
is something that is animated and alive and a, a healthy walk. And then finally, select a sidewalk widening where it's necessary just to make it work at all. For transit, the existing transit system, of course, is the large bus transit system. And that functions as well as it does, or as well as it can, within the same matrix of heavy traffic that all of you experience in cars. And so, while well, it's frustrating as an individual to get caught in traffic and run behind, when a bus runs behind, it leaves a whole lot of people frustrated and behind. And it becomes a cumulative problem where you have bus waiting for, or people waiting for a bus who are waiting for the next bus. And, and, ah, it's that. Sorry, thanks. Um, so, so one thing that we need to look at is you know, what can you connect most efficiently so that you can improve access to local trips within the TOD area while also accommodating the longer haul trips through the TOD area by having dedicated transit lanes that connect the districts all along the Washington Boulevard corridor. Oh, it's uh, the clicker. Okay, my distance. <laughs> All right. Is that better? Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so um, there are a variety of ways that we're thinking about transit that are different from what transit is today. Um, and we've talked to the transportation department here who are really looking down the same, um, in the same direction at, at what's called microtransit, which is smaller vehicles, more frequent, shorter headways, fewer passengers, but more responsive to individual uh, travel needs. And so um, they also, however, to be efficient, need to be in a transit dedicated lane. We can also help to alleviate some of the traffic loading on the district and on Washington Boulevard in particular by looking toward a future that encourages a shared parking approach of parking, of structured parking that would be part of new development that might be unbundled from the development need itself and made available for public use so that, for example, employees could park at one end of Washington Boulevard and take one of these microtransit connectors to their own place of employment and be able to do so without having to find a place to store their car while they're at their place of employment. They could operate either as a public service or as a timeout. I turned off my button. <laughs> um, either as a public service or as a, a service that is organized by private businesses or entities or consortium, consortia of private businesses. Um, it might, for example, connect the two metro stations, the Expo Station and the La Cienega Station, uh, with employment centers that tend to be focused on Jefferson Boulevard and in the downtown. And they might also, there could be multiple loops, and they could be flexible loops. We don't know how such a system might be designed, because there are many ways in which they could be designed. They could be on call, they could be regular service, they could have fixed stops, they could have random stops uh, that are user uh, directed. They could be linked with a, a, a smart info system that you could use on your phone to call it kind of cross between public transit and Uber and uh, with nice drivers and well paid. And uh, the combination of those things, of the transit dedicated lane, of distributed and shared parking, and of these micro transit mini loops, mini systems, will help to pull some of the demand off of Washington Boulevard. For bus
bikes. Bikes are, are, are interesting in this town. It's, it's a growing interest. There's a growing constituency of bike riders. Um, and there are a lot of good opportunities already that can get better. So what we're looking at with the bikes is the development of uh, an east-west spine that could be Washington Boulevard and Culver Boulevard combined. That's starting at La Cienega and ending on the far west end of Culver City on Culver Boulevard. You could have a bike track that connects the city along its entire length, serving much of the residential parts of the city, which abut that alignment to the south of it. One, two, improvements and connections and better points of access to the Bayona Creek bike path. And three, a network of bike-friendly streets within the residential neighborhoods that allows you ready and safe access to the larger network so that you can circulate on a bike in a variety of scales of rides for local use, for recreational use, for longer hauls. We have a new theory about the feedback. <laughs> We're thinking maybe if it's under the speaker. You're standing under the speaker. Maybe if you, you turn this off. I think you turn this off now. So maybe if you stay equidistant. <laughs> 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 try standing closer to the How's this? Does that work better? Yes. Yeah. All right, good. Good. I don't feel like it's being amplified at all, but that's okay. I'll just speak louder. Um, where was I? Uh, the, the biggest, one of the bigger issues with, with bike circulation is issues at intersections where you've got crossings. And so there are a number of places where there need to be improved crossings for the bike routes, bike trails, bike paths. At, at major intersections. And like I said before, there need to be some important connections to the Bionic Creek path that would help to pull a lot of the need. If you're, if, you know, for example, um, a kid in the Arts District or Rancho Aguera who might want to be able to bike to school at Len Howe, how do they get there today? It's difficult because you've got to cross a number of major roads. <coughs> if you could go to the end of the street, access the Bionic Creek path, take it down to ends and come up you could be there without having to negotiate major traffic ways. So that, that concept. There are also other, a few places where we think there can be connections down to the creek. Um, for example, where it says up top, connect to Bionic Creek. And point to that, Joel, please. Thank you. Um, it's not easy, but there's room to be able to slip from Washington Boulevard a ramp trail down to connect with the head of the Bionic Creek Trail so that you can connect directly from the residential neighborhood down there, as well as a number of other points along the way. <coughs> These are some of the ideas about intersection improvement. I'm going to talk more about that later at Washington and National. Because um, we have a couple of different ways of, of addressing the big issue of the missing link between the end of the metro bike trail on National and it's picking up again on the other side, the west side of Venice, northwest side. Um, there's a couple of ways to do that. And they range from the simple to the less simple, <laughs> to the less expensive to the really expensive. But there's, there are all ways to address that connection. Um, one, and this is frankly one that we're recommending in the sense that it's the most direct and connects best to the idea we have for the rest of the system, is to simply, by reconfiguring the intersection at Washington and National, we can slip the two-way bike lane two-way bike track on the north side of National all the way up to Venice, where it connects to Venice and where it can also connect as it crosses Washington with a similar two-way bike track along the south side of Washington Boulevard. The south side, again, because it addresses the 
residential neighborhoods that are the primary source of uh, need. Second way is to deflect up Wesley. The bike track ends, uh, the metro trail ends uh, at the foot of Wesley. Um, without making any changes to anything in terms of the intersection configuration, you can come up Wesley and head south or west on Washington Boulevard. Um, to do that continuously will require some modification to some of the bus stops currently. And when we get to our, our vision plan for Washington Boulevard, we have to remember that we're imagining a future where the existing bus system is, is, is not the same as what the future transit system would be. And then third is that you can slice through the Gordian knot and do a uh, grade separated elevated crossing for pedestrians and bikes that begins on the end of the metro trail on the east and connects again to the metro trail on the west with a number of option opportunities for getting down on by foot and by bike uh, into the transit center. And we played with this a little bit because it was too much fun not to. <laughs> There's um, the opportunity for this bridge with a number of, of, of knuckles along the way that between stairs, ramps, and elevators can get pedestrians and bikes up and down, can cross Venice to connect to the bus station on the north side of Venice that is the major westbound drop-off for the transit center. Um, and then connect again on the far west with the Metro Trail. And we'll just sort of show a few of those. There's the, you can see the Venice Boulevard connection over there. It's awesome. Right, it's pedestrians and bikes together. And that's, that's exactly right, so you've got you see on this, we've got a separation between the bikes on the left and the pedestrians on the right and to acknowledge the fact that they travel at different speeds and have different kind of mobility access needs. So in summary, we're talking about the east-west bikes, Washington Culver from La Cienega to the west side, connecting the metro bike path in one of those options, new connections to the Bionic Creek bike path, and a network of bike-friendly streets. So that's the bike framework that we're looking at. Then let's look at the traffic network. Traffic network is all about deflecting through traffic from the center of the community. It's keeping that traffic which doesn't belong there and taking it somewhere else. <coughs> And the generalized concept that's represented here is that you've got major arteries, Venice and Jefferson, as potential ways of deflecting traffic around the downtown from, the, from the, the, both directions. But they have some disconnects, so we'll talk about those in a minute. And then if we can manage the access to the employment centers along the Jefferson corridor, which are high today and will get higher in the future, so that you can take that access principally off of Jefferson without filtering the traffic through the community to the north and west, then you're helping to alleviate the traffic impacts at the center. Similarly, if you have access to that distributed parking system I described a few minutes ago along Venice, uh, Washington Boulevard, if you have access from the northwest off of Venice, you're also keeping traffic that would be through traffic there circulating through trying to find a place to park out of the core of the area. So that, that's the principle we're trying to approach here. Um, and the way it works now, of course, is you've got you know, Venice is Venice. Um, the Jefferson connection gets really wonky around Jefferson, around National, right? Because it doesn't connect through. You've got this missing link that doesn't allow you to connect directly. You would also need to have additional points of entry into the Hayden Tract and the employment centers to the, on the, the west side of uh, Jefferson. Um, and we looked at, you could make a road that connects at the Washington La Cienega junction and redirects traffic south 
in a new road on one side or the other of the creek or over the creek or half over and half not over in a cantilevered approach. We had, we've, we've done half a dozen little sketches of things that could happen to the point that we know it would be feasible physically. Um, jurisdictionally, it's difficult. You're dealing with two cities. You're dealing with a lot of money. You're dealing with a major piece of infrastructure. But it would be a way that you could deflect the traffic around the core communities here and onto Jeffers. Also, we just throw it in every time we say it. It's, it's, it there needs to be some resolution of the I-10 Robertson interchange. And you know, that, again, is something that is beyond the ability of Culver City to implement. The city's already playing a role in the study of it. Um, but it's something that is a complex, multi-jurisdictional uh, issue with uh, a high price tag and, and a long time frame on it. So, so in, in all of the subsequent drawings we're looking at here, we are assuming that the I-10 Robertson interchange remains as it is today for at least 10 years in the future, maybe more. So traffic calming on Washington, improved access from the perimeter road, and future connection to Jefferson Boulevard. What I didn't mention in the earlier part was the traffic calming on Washington, which is what we'll be talking about mostly here tonight. But that's a principal tool for deflecting the traffic, making it harder for through traffic to use Washington Boulevard as a through corridor. So you calm it, slow it down, and make it less easy so that it's the less efficient choice for a through motorist to take rather than one of the other uh, alternatives. All right, so having talked about deflecting the traffic and trying to keep the traffic out of the neighborhoods, we know that there will still be efforts to, um, uh, as Peter calls them, rent runners, who will you know, try to find the alternate routes through the neighborhoods in order to bypass the traffic situation. So we need to be looking at a series of short-term and uh, accessible um, measures that would help to discourage that through traffic condition. So the first one is we really think that as long as there is only one way into the Hayden track, you're going to have an impact from traffic coming and going from the Hayden track. It's, it's, there's, there's the only way in and out is through your neighborhoods. So we've got to find alternate ways to do that. Until you do that, we don't think it makes sense to cul-de-sac Higuera, as many of you have suggested. We don't think it's a crazy idea, but it is if you cut off the only, well, there's two ways into Hayden Track. You'd be getting rid of one of them. So you're, you're eliminating and pushing all of the access to the Hayden Track to one entry point, which would be from the North on National. So it's, a, it's, it's an issue that can be solved, and actually you'll see some things very soon, um, that can be solved by having more crossings of the creek that get access into the, uh, the Hayden Track. Um, and until that time, you shouldn't cul-de-sac it. However, you're about to learn what it's like when it's cul-de-sac when they take the bridge out for reconstruction for however many months that's going to be. And in a sense, that becomes a trial run or a test of what that would be like when you do close the gear. And it's not likely to be pretty. Along with ex additional access, though, we're not just talking about getting cars into the employment center in uh, Hayden Track and along Jefferson, but we're talking about finding other ways of getting people into their jobs there. And some of those mini circulators, mini transit circulators we talked about a few minutes ago, are another way of dealing with that. If the road, um, the major Jefferson Road connector is infeasible in a near term, we think there may be some opportunities for some connections along Santony out to, I think it's called La Cienega Place. It's, it's that little stem on the uh, east side of, of, uh, of the creek um, that would give alternate egress. 
whether that's a road for cars, which doesn't strike us as a great idea, or at least a pedestrian and bike bridge, which strikes us as a good idea or a better one, um, is an open question at this point. But some connection that gives another outlet from that northeast portion of the city, uh, besides Washington Boulevard, would be helpful. Other uh, neighborhood protection measures, I think the, on the north side of National, the Jacob Street option is too convenient for people now, and it should be made less convenient. It can be made less convenient through a series of speed bumps, maybe some stop signs, maybe some other bulb outs and other things that could be implemented, maybe not at every intersection, but at enough of them that the option of taking Jacob as an alternative to something else is not a desirable option and helps to discourage it. We have some other notions about access from the north on Mount Washington that would help to do that as well. On Higuera, we've talked about this before. There are the traffic roundabouts, but they're pretty ineffective. And they're ineffective for a couple of reasons. They're too small. They can't get a whole lot bigger because they're not that much right away, but they can get a bit bigger. And in combination with ball bounce at the intersections, it can help to encourage traffic to deflect. In other words, right now you've got the circle and people <laughs> zip right by it without really even having to barely swerve. What you want them to have to do is deflect through around a, a ball bounce, a curved ball bounce, around the circle, and around another curved ball bounce in order to get into the continue on the roadway. It'll slow them down, and it'll slow them down significantly. Um, on INS, we think similar measures could happen. It may not require that same measure, although a lot of these are interchangeable between the two streets. We think raised intersections on INS could go a long way toward making them safer for pedestrians with that pedestrian priority street system we talked about, and also make it more convenient for bicyclists by slowing the traffic down. An intersection platform is, is it just you raise the intersection at six inches with a somewhat steep ramp in the sense that it almost is like a speed try to see another way to go. So the neighborhood protection measures we're talking about are traffic coming on the streets, improved pedestrian linkages so that there are better ways to move about for the residents new connections to uh, Bayona Creek. Shows up as two bullets, that's interesting. Implementation rather than physical, physical intervention. And um, what, what it allows to happen is for a whole toolkit, basket of, of, of tools to be implemented and managed um, between the public and the private sector with oversight by a transportation management association. So it allows for the city and developers and businesses to understand from the outset what the expectations and requirements are to build those into their program and their development uh, plans. And it means everybody is expecting and knows the same thing. And then you've got an association that oversees that, manages it, and monitors it, and could, for example, be the Receiving entity for and then receiving and managing entity for uh, development impact fees that are focused on transit or transportation issues, um, and along with that, there needs to be a rich tool kit of things that can be implemented that are all designed to reduce the number of people in in the single <laughs> occupancy vehicles, and it can be transit uh, uh, allowances. It can be um, transit provided by the business. It can be you know, bike and, and car sharing options. There's a whole array of things, and we'll be vetting those over the next couple of weeks with the city to come up with a list that is acceptable to the city, that is tested in other cities. We know, for example, that Santa Monica, Glendale, West Hollywood all have such transportation management association systems in place in order to manage the future of mobility in the city. Wayfinding, I touched on that a little bit before. Um, 
it's hard to find your way around. It's hard to know what's going on. It's hard to understand how transit works uh, as a pedestrian, as a transit user, or simply as a, a, a visitor to the city to know if there is shared parking, where to find it, to not only know where to find it, but to know how many cars, car spaces are available in it, and how you use it, to understand how to use the transit, to understand how to get from the transit hubs to your destinations, um, to understand how to get from your transit hub to your connecting transit or to your bike share uh, center. Um, this can all be done through a relatively simple system of signage on the one hand, with comprehensive and clear mapping, but can also be done through handheld apps and other kinds of technical smart city applications that allow everybody access to real-time information about how the city is moving. So smart city con con connectivity, comprehensive district-wide signing system, uh, pedestrian and user-oriented mapping. It should be legible by the users. It's it's it's. You know, so often you get transit maps, in this city especially, and they are impossible to figure out. They've been done by the transit engineers with, for their route planning purposes, and I'm sure it makes sense to them, but to the average user, you can't figure out where you're going and how you're going to get there. Um, and then real-time transit information that allows you to know when is the bus coming, where do I get my transfer, how do I get, you know, when am I going to arrive at my destination. Then TOD expansion. Um, Transit-oriented district today is a relatively constrained geographic area. Um, in an area that is currently and in the future will continue to experience a lot of aggressive development demand. This is an area that will grow. City of LA on the other side of Venice has figured that out. They are about to adopt an upzoning measure that would allow for creative industry development in the area between Venice Boulevard and the freeway and beyond. Um, that is exactly the kind of industry and business that Culver City has been attracting for the last number of years, and that you will all continue to experience the demand for in the next coming few years. There's a lot of it. It's, we've talked about it before as the kind of Silicon Beach wave that's just continuing to roll inland, um, and it's come from Playa, it's come up Jefferson, it's come to Hayden Tract, it's come to downtown, it's, on, it, it's here. And so it's important to have, as a city, tools available in advance that allow you to be clear about your expectations for development and to the developer to have a clear understanding of what the city is going to require. So it doesn't become something that is a kind of negotiated thing at the time when you first see it. You know, it's, it's, it, it becomes less discretionary and a little more, um, a little more regulatory, a little clearer. So this is just an indication. That's all of that. All of the, the pink and, and the blue areas there are areas that are are areas that are subject to change in the future and probably the relatively near future of that. Current TOD district is the yellow area outlined here. What we're intending to propose is that that be expanded to include this area indicated between the between Robertson and the downtown on the west and the area south of National Revolt, <coughs> all of the non-residential zoned areas there, so that they can be ready to respond to demand for future development. It will happen. We're also one possibility is to anticipate whether it's full TOD or whether it's some measure of expectations for future development demands along the Washington Boulevard corridor. It's constrained because the lot depths are pretty shallow, and you're not going to have the same scale of development that you're looking at in the core area, but there are going to be demands as the city grows for something to happen along that corridor. And the city should be ready for that, too. So there may be some opportunities to look at, at TOD provisions or development standards that could be applied in all of these areas. One of those things which we talked about in the pedestrian network idea is the, is the, the requirement for various pedestrian easements through the development so that you have an ability to move 
without having to deflect around onto the major boulevards. Um, Jill, you might show the connection between the transit center and through the uh, Hoke Willet block to the west along the city line. Move away, yeah, that's the one. And, and uh, through uh, connections on the south side that permit, uh, permit linkages to, to Limblade, uh, so that you've got, currently there's walking streets that could be walking streets, but they're dead end. You can't get any once you get there. So with relatively little intervention to connect through as an easement or some other provision, you could have a um, really nice walking environment. So this, again, is, is the current development in the TOD district area, and the areas that it might expand to as we're considering it are shown as this. And among the provisions besides the Paseos are modified setbacks in order to allow for a more generous sidewalk on Washington Boulevard, for example, the demand for active street frontages, the implementation of shared parking strategies, the implementation of TDM policies, you can coordinate the development planning with the city's other measures, which should include the uh, Transportation Department's Mobility Action Plan, which is a multimodal approach to mobility in the city. So now we get to Washington Boulevard. And we saved it for last because it's the one that we've got the most detail on. We have um, focused on how to turn, return, I should say, Washington Boulevard to its role as a local street. And how that street can help to tie together all of these principles we've looked at so far into a coherent whole. So we're going to uh, look at the entire length of the boulevard from downtown out to La Cienega. And we've tested along that length one of the sections that we all reviewed a couple of sessions back. The one that, that we've landed on with kind of the most discussion. There was no consensus on it from the public, but there were, I think, a lot of strong statements about a two-way bike trail, bike, protected bike track. On one side of the street, a pair of flex lanes, which would be transit and parking. They would be stripped of parking at peak hours, and it would function as transit on peak hours. Um, function as transit on peak hours would be parking allowed off peak during the middle of the day. For transit, ultimately, with the kind of multiple and complex microtransit systems we're talking about. But in the short term, it might also be for HOV lanes or for electric vehicle lanes or for corporate shuttles, or we can define what the conditions are, but limited access, not just the current bus system. It would be a way that you could get higher occupancies, higher frequencies threaded through the street without being congested by the traffic at peak hours. And then what that means is that you are reduced to one travel lane in each direction for cars along most of the route. <clears throat> but that's a section that can't be applied uniformly along the length of Washington Boulevard because the right-of-way changes, the median conditions change, a number of things change along its length. So we've taken the, the effort to lay this out. Uh, it's, it, it, it looks, it's precise, it's measured, it's not engineered. It's carefully drawn. It's still, in a sense, a hardline sketch. But it was enough for us to feel comfortable that it works. So here's just a couple of views. This would be Washington uh, looking east at Higuera. Um, oh, yeah. Well, when we get to the plan. Um, here we are looking at the expo station. So you can see the green in all of these drawings from here out is the two-way bike track. The pink is the flex lane for transit and HOV and parking off-peak. And, and what kind of trees are those? Those are, <laughs> those are, those are dodecahedrous trees. <laughs> it's drought resistant. <laughs> uh, they're sketch-up trees. <laughs> um, here we are a little bit farther east in the Arts District. 
And then just to see what would happen if you didn't have on that east end of the arts uh, of Washington, the arts district, if you did not have the two-way bike track, which is a possibility. That might be a future, longer-term future thing. You could retain parking on the one side of the street, and this situ this uh, condition still works. So we're going to start at the west end and move east, focusing in on this intersection at Parcel B, where Washington and Ince kind of collide. And you can see that, yeah? Separate question. In, the end, in some of the sessions, we talked about not having it and having it be a left-hand turn lane. And from the last image that you showed, it looked like there were sections where that would be a turning lane. You'll see. Direction. You'll see in a minute when we get to the plans up at that end. It turns out the median does play an important role in the turning movement uh, options. Um, so, did I just back up? I just backed up. Sorry. So, at this intersection, you can see that we have the bike lane coming up Culver, hugging the south side of Washington, turning at Ince, and continuing up along the entire length of the street. We've illustrated a couple of things here, including how bus stops would work. Bus stops have been an issue with the short-term planning with the bike track today because of the location, because of the need for uh, separate, because of the platform requirement, stopping requirement for a bus stop. In this scheme, what we have is the bike track in green. The kind of paler yellow is, kind of yellow beige, is, is the buffer area between the bike track and the roadway. And it, at the bus stops, it would widen so that you have enough room for an accessible bike bus, accessible bus stop uh, along the route. Um, we also, in this particular segment, the West End, we have an issue with width, and we would want in the long term to be able to get more right-of-way, and the way we would have to do that is to dedicate a portion of the street, probably the north side, in order to be able to get sidewalk and all of these turn lane movements in. Is that right? Do I get that right? Yeah. You want to talk about this a little bit? No. Let's go. All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> Moving up Washington, so here we are at the Robertson Aguirre intersection with Washington. And you can see, um, again, we've got, with the median cut on the eastbound Washington, the ability for a left turn lane onto Robertson. You have a right turn lane into Higuera, but what we've done is given Higuera a bit of a road diet by extending and narrowing the roadway so that it's a less thorough, thoroughfare type connection from Robertson. We've looked at all of the ideas about deflecting traffic southbound from Robertson to not allow it to go farther south on Higuera, and there are issues with every way that you try to do that. Here, what it does is it contradicts our intention by forcing all of the southbound Robertson traffic onto Washington, which is where we're trying to make it go away. So that didn't make logical sense to us. At Venice, you have a current configuration that simply doesn't allow it. It's too complex to have forced lefts and forced rights out of a southbound Robertson off of the freeway, given all of the different roadways that are entering into there. Let me see it better. Let's see. Yeah, you can see it better here, where you have exposition, Robertson, Venice, the, the angle that everything's coming in at, the train going over with the structure and so forth. It, it's, you can't force it. So we concluded that the best option is to, is to give Higuera a road diet there narrow it down a lot. And then with the further road calming, traffic calming measures along the length of Higuera, it becomes even less of a desirable option. Um, you can see here an example of, for, of what could happen with the uh, imaginary future development on the sites west of, of, uh, of the transit center. Um, these are all imaginary, as you can see. But because um, they imagine that everything that is there today has gone away. But and we don't know what it will be. But 
they're, again, given the kinds of industry development, business development that's happening in this direction, you're likely to see footprints and massing of that kind of size. And if you are, you're going to want to make sure that it's, there's a certain amount of pedestrian porosity and pedestrian life that goes with it that helps to connect all of the people from not just from the transit station point of view, but really from the whole neighborhood circulation point of view. Um, as we, oh, we already looked at that, sorry. Moving up, um, looking at the transit station area itself, we've got multiple points where we have to have buses connect with the transit. And given the sort of, not even triangular, but trapezoidal nature of the block, um, that makes it tricky. But on Washington Boulevard, you can see the uh, major bus drop off for Washington and the, um, on both sides of the street. And unfortunately, hidden under the bridge is a, is a proposal for a new block crossing. Right? Is that still there? Yes. Yeah, right. It's, it's right under the bridge, uh, next to the driveway entry into the hotel. Um, there's also a kind of secondary transfer and transit center on Robertson on the east side of Robertson, where you've got not only the bus transfer, but also um, kiss and ride, uh, Uber Lyft type services and so forth. And then Metro's uh, bus services on Washington, uh, Venice on the north side. So you've got, but on Washington, what, we are, are, what we've got is, is uh, this kind of transit hub with a mid-block crossing that allows a signalized crossing with, for pedestrians, we hope, that would prevent or avoid a lot of the jaywalking that happens there now when people get off the bus to connect to the rail. It, it, people don't want to walk all the way up to Nashville and back down again to do it. Here's the area of National and the, the intersection of National and Washington that we were talking about before. This shows what we are thinking about with regard to the two-way bike track on both National and Washington. And it travels along the north side of National, crosses directly to a reconfigured turn, a reconfigured curb line at, in front of Access that brings the curb further out, reduces the radius, which will slow down turn rate, turn speeds, so you don't get cars turning at a higher speed on that right turn from eastbound National to, or westbound National to eastbound uh, Washington. Um, we've gained that and room for some more sidewalk on the south side of National by losing one of the left turn lanes, which makes sense from a couple of points of view. Mainly that we have traffic turning left onto Washington there into one travel lane, so you don't want to have two left turn lanes into one. You can see that the median continues to pick up here, and we use that as the buffer for, uh, for left turn movements. And as we continue up uh, Washington to the east, we're, one of the issues with, with this segment, this whole segment from, really from Helms on, on east to La Cienega, is that you have too many streets entering the, uh, the boulevard. Um, they're offset, as you can see. Um, and so what we're proposing here is that we limit left turns into some of those streets in order to, in part, discourage through traffic as shortcuts, and in part, to allow for a little more controlled flow through the street. So if we look at an example of one of these, Cataraugus, let's say, we have the ability to turn left onto the extension of fate of the north. Um, we have no left turn from the westbound south to Cataraugus, for example. Or I should also say we're thinking about some other things here, and we haven't really depicted them yet, but there may be ways in which those, uh, these street entrances in here might be reconfigured with, with bulb outs and so forth at the curbs so that it, it narrows the entry into the street and makes it a less obvious 
through street or shortcut street um, choice. When we talked about distributed parking, one of the things that people pointed out to us was the opportunity possibly of using the excessive right of way on La Cienega Avenue, which is that extension of La Cienega that kind of connects with McManus. <coughs> Pardon me. And so we looked at a number of options for how you might use that as, as one of those distributed parking sites. We had three different studies that we looked at. Um, it's true that the parking on the street right now is very inefficient. There's only about eight spaces, I think it is, that exist there today. Uh, not because of the length of it, but because there are a lot of driveway cuts and so forth. And a direct approach could be, <coughs> I'm sorry, could be to put angle parking in the median. Joel, you want to show that in the middle? On option one. Put angle parking in the median, which is a relatively inexpensive solution to it. It only gains you about 10 more parking spaces. So it's not like a big deal, but it gets you 10 more parking spaces. If you were to choose option two, which is a parking structure, um, because the width isn't quite wide enough, it's wide for a street, but it's not wide enough for a parking structure that's efficient, you could get what do we say, about 100, about 60, about, about 60 cars in a five level structure, not very efficient. If you use an automated parking system, sort of like what Holmes has recently put in, you could probably double that to 120. Then you'd be talking about employee or res local resident area or parking. And then the third, which is the most ambitious and the most costly and the least cost effective maybe, is the um, idea of putting levels of parking under it. And for that to be at all efficient, you'd really want to cooperate with the city of LA and do the whole block. Put a park on top of it, always sounds great, but it would be a costly park. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it only yields you about 110 parking spaces. So it's not a very efficient solution. While the first one doesn't yield a lot, you can do it tomorrow or the day after. And it doesn't cost you very much, but some restriving. <clears throat> so that's the end. That's what we've done so far. And that's how we intend to proceed um, <clears throat> with these categories. And what I'd like to do is, even though it feels sort of formal sitting here in a kind of audience situation, in the past, we've broken up into tables, and the tables have had discussions, and then somebody at each table has given a report back and so forth. Um, we're not going to do that here. We don't have tables. But it's also, I think, time to open up to individuals who may feel they haven't had their voice heard or commentary on pe from people who have spoken up but haven't seen what they thought was going to happen here. Or you can say nice things, too. But, <laughs> but I know that's probably low on your list. 